John Fitzgerald Orkin Kennedy. Minister, members of the Parliament, I am grateful for your welcome and for that of the, your countrymen. Thirteenth day of September, 1862, will be a day that long remembered in American history. At Fredericksburg, Maryland, thousands of men fought and died on one of the bloodiest battlefields of the American Civil War. One of the most brilliant stories of that day was written by a band of 1,200 men who went into battle wearing a green sprig in their hats. They bore a proud heritage and a special courage given to those who had long fought for the cause of freedom. I am referring, of course, to the Irish Brigade. General Robert E. Lee, the great military leader of the Southern Confederate forces, said of this group of men, after the battle, the gallant stand which this bold brigade made on the heights of Fredericksburg is well known. Never were men so brave. They ennobled their race by their splendid gallantry on that desperate occasion. Their brilliant, though hopeless, assault on our lines excited the hearty applause of our officers and soldiers. Of the 1,200 men who took part in that assault, 280 survived the battle. The Irish Brigade was led into battle on that occasion by Brigadier General Thomas F. Marr, who had participated in the unsuccessful Irish uprising of 1848, was captured by the British, and sent in a prison ship to Australia, from whence he finally came to America. In the fall of 1862, after serving with distinction and gallantry in some of the toughest fighting of this most bloody struggle, the Irish Brigade was presented with a new set of flags. In the city ceremony, the city chamberlain gave them the motto, The Union, Our Country, and Ireland Forever. Their old ones having been torn to shreds by bullets in previous battles, Captain Richard McGee, took possession of these flags on December 2nd in New York City and arrived with them on the Battle of Fredericksburg and carried them in the battle. There's also an unconfirmed rumor that Hoban was never fully paid for his work on the White House. If this proves to be true, I will speak to the, our Secretary of the Treasury about it, although I hear this body is not particularly interested in the subject of revenue. <laughs> I am proud to be the first American president to visit Ireland during his term of office, proud to be addressing this distinguished assembly, and proud of the welcome that you have given me. My presence and your welcome, however, only symbolize the many and the enduring links which have bound the Irish and the Americans since the earliest days. Benjamin Franklin, the envoy of the American Revolution, who was also born in Boston, was received by the Irish Parliament in 1772. It was neither independent nor free from discrimination at the time. But Franklin reported its members, and I quote him, are disposed to be friends of America. By joining our interest with theirs, he said, a more equitable treatment might be obtained for both of our nations. Our interests have been joined ever since. Franklin sent leaflets to Irish freedom fighters. O'Connell was influenced by Washington, and Emmett influenced Lincoln. Irish volunteers played so predominant a role in the American army that Lord Mountjoy lamented in the British Parliament, we have lost America through the Irish. 
John Barry, whose statue was on it yesterday and whose sword is in my office, was only one who fought for liberty in America to set an example for liberty in Ireland. Yesterday was the 117th anniversary of the birth of Charles Stuart Parnell, whose grandfather fought under Barry and whose mother was born in America and who at the age of 34 was invited to address the American Congress on the cause of Irish freedom. I have seen since I've been in this country, he said, so many tokens of the good wishes of the American people towards Ireland. And today, 83 years later, I can say to you that I have seen in this country so many tokens of good wishes of the Irish people towards America. And today I am certain Free Ireland, a full-fledged member of the world community where some are not yet free and where some counsel an acceptance of tyranny, Free Ireland will not be satisfied with anything less than liberty. I am glad, therefore, that Ireland is moving in the mainstream of current world events. For I sincerely believe that your future is as promising as your past is proud, and that your destiny lies not as a peaceful island in a sea of trouble, but as a maker and a shaper of world peace. For self-determination can no longer mean isolation, and the achievement of national independence today means withdrawal from the old status only to return to the world scene with a new one. New nations can build with their former governing powers the same kind of fruitful relationship which Ireland has established with Great Britain, a relationship founded on equality and mutual interest. And no nation, large or small, can be indifferent to the fate of others, near or far. Modern economics weapons and communications have made us realize more than ever that we are one human family and this one planet is our home. The world is large, John Boyle O'Reilly wrote. The world is large when it's weary leaves, two loving hearts divide, but the world is small when your enemy is losing on the other side. It's stronger than all the hosts of error. Ireland is clad in the cause of national and human liberty with peace to the extent that peace is disturbed by conflict between the former colonial powers and the new and developing nations. Ireland's role is unique for every new nation knows that Ireland was the first of the small nations of the 20th century to win its struggle for independence. And that the Irish have traditionally sent their doctors and technicians and soldiers and priests to help other lands keep liberty alive. At the same time, Ireland is part of Europe, associated with the Council of Europe, progressing in the context of Europe, and a prospective member of an expanded European common market. Thus, Ireland has excellent relations with both the old and the new. The confidence of both sides and an opportunity to act where the actions of greater powers might be looked upon with suspicion. The central issue of freedom, however, is between those who believe in self-determination and those in the East who would impose upon others a harsh and repressive communist system. And here your nation wisely rejects the role of a go-between or a mediator. Ireland pursues an independent course in foreign policy, but it is not neutral between liberty and tyranny, and never will be. <laughs> For knowing the meaning of foreign domination, Ireland is the example and inspiration to those enduring endless years of oppression it was fitting and appropriate that this nation played a leading role 
in censuring the suppression of the Hungarian Revolution. For how many times was Ireland's quest for freedom suppressed? Only to have that quest renewed. Only to have that quest renewed by the succeeding generation. Those who suffer beyond that wall I saw on Wednesday in Berlin must not despair of their future. Let them remember the constancy, the faith, the endurance, and the final success of the Irish. And let them remember, as I heard sung by your sons and daughters yesterday in Wexford, the words, the boys of Wexford, who fought with heart and hand to burst in twain the galling chain and free our native land. major forum for your nation's greater role in world affairs is that of protector of the weak and voice of the small, the United Nations. From Cork to the Congo, from Galway to the Gaza Strip, from this legislative assembly to the United Nations, Ireland is sending its most talented men to do the world's most important work, the work of peace. In a sense, this export of talent is in keeping with an historic Irish role. But you no longer go as exiles and immigrants, but for the service of your country, and indeed of all men. Like the Irish missionaries of medieval days, like the wild geese, you are not content to sit by your fireside while others are in need of your help. Nor are you content with the recollections of the past when you face the responsibilities of the present. Twenty-six sons of Ireland have died in the Congo. Many others have been wounded. I pay tribute to them and to all of you for your commitment and dedication to world order. And their sacrifice reminds us all that we must not fall now. The United Nations must be fully and fairly financed. Its peacekeeping machinery must be strengthened. Its institutions must be developed until someday and perhaps some distant day, a world of law is achieved. Ireland's influence in the United Nations is far greater than your relative size. You have not hesitated to take the lead on such sensitive issues as the Kashmir dispute, and you sponsored that most vital resolution adopted by the General Assembly, which opposed the spread of nuclear arms to any nation not now possessing them urging an international agreement with inspection and control. And I pledge to you that the United States of America will do all in its power to achieve such an agreement and fulfill your resolution. I speak of these matters today not because Ireland is unaware of its role, but I think it important that uh, you know that we know what you have done. And I speak to remind the other small nations that they too can and must help build a world peace. They too, as we all are, are dependent on the United Nations for security, for an equal chance to be heard, for progress towards a world made safe for diversity. The peacekeeping machinery of the United Nations cannot work without the help of the smaller nations, nations whose forces threaten no one, and whose forces can thus help create a world in which no nation is threatened. Great powers have their responsibilities and their burdens, but the smaller nations of the world must fulfill their obligations as well. A great Irish poet once wrote, I believe profoundly in the future of Ireland that this is an isle of destiny that that destiny will be glorious and that when our hour has come, we will have something to give to the world. My friends, Ireland's hour has come. You have something to give to the world and that is a future of peace with freedom.
Shalach and Tana from Boyer's the Wild. Can't call it.